Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. You join us on a classic festive period day in the UK, peeing down with rain. <laughs> Standard practice in the UK. Today I wanted to give you an update on the Abarth, hence we're driving the Abarth 500 SS. Now, I've realized that in the previous videos that we've done on the Abarth, I didn't give you a full backstory on why I purchased the Abarth. Why did I buy this car? What enticed me to purchase an Abarth 500? A lot of people have said that the car looks really small for me and they're quite surprised that I purchased this car. So, so today we're gonna to go into a backstory and a bit of back history on why I purchased this car. And also, I'm gonna give you an update on the car, how it's been running since the terrible engine blow up that occurred um, towards the end of last year. That was rectified at the beginning of this year. So, let's get into the video. So why did I buy the Abarth 500? Well, I was using at the time a Vauxhall Cavalier 1.8 with a, the old style mechanical injection, so it's a 1.8i, to do a lot of traveling to and from London. Um, because I was consulting a lot in London and I needed a car to crunch the miles in effect. So for all the commuting I was doing to London there and back all the time, and I was living away in London in a week, but that's a different story. I needed a car that was doing that, that would deal with uh, a lot of mileage um, and that would replace the, the Vauxhall Cavalier. Now the Vauxhall Cavalier was a, a bit of a banger of a car. <laughs> Try and slot in a picture here if we can get one from the archives. But it was dead reliable. It was a super reliable car. And that thing just crunched the miles and was really regular. As long as I had it serviced, got the brakes done, etc. etc. It just carried on crunching the miles. It wasn't anything fantastic to drive, but you didn't really need anything more than that for driving all the hundreds of miles to London and back, London and back, London and back, all the time. And of course, I could park that car anywhere and I didn't, didn't worry with regards to it being damaged, etc. It was reversed into one time in a car park, actually. But there you go, people do those sorts of things in London a lot. So yeah, why the Abarth 500? Well. I'd always been enamored by the, uh, by the original Abarth 500. It's what they call the Cinque Trento. Now I've probably pronounced that wrong, but in effect that, that's Italian for 500. I always loved the styling of that original Abarth. Uh, well, obviously I wasn't gonna buy one of those to, to drive it to and from London. I couldn't see that being very reliable and it's not the greatest performance of cars or greatest performer of cars. But I always liked that styling, and then I heard that the Fiat 500s were going to be reissued. So I thought, oh well, maybe that's the car. So I had a look into it, I actually had a test drive of a, of a Fiat 500. But I love the styling of the car, But and, I, and no disregard to anybody who's got a normal Fiat 500. The thing was pretty gutless, and I thought, yes, and it, it wasn't really sporty enough. So I thought, yeah, I, I'm not going to buy one of these. What, you know, and I went back to the drawing board. And then I heard that the Abarth 500 was going to be released in 2009. So circa around a year, year and a half after the Fiat 500 was released. And I thought, ah, brilliant. Let's get a test drive in one of those. So I actually put a, I think I put a deposit down on one of them, first of all. I put a deposit down with um, a dealership um, and then I changed, I cancelled that deposit and then I went with another dealership called Vospers based in Plymouth. And I went down and I test drove the car and they were very good, very good down there in, in Plymouth. A long way to drive, but who cares, you know, when you're getting a car, you know, the key thing is that you buy the car from the right dealership. And I, drew, I went down there, I test drove the Abarth 500, absolutely loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, so I decided, yep, yeah, that's the car. It's the Abarth 500, so that's what I wanted. Now remember, this was to replace the Vauxhall Cavalier 1.8 injection. And I was still married at the time. Now, why is that relevant? Well, that's relevant because we also had a Mercedes 2.7i um, and an ML270 in effect. And we were using that as the a, as a mileage crunch for Norman, doing the normal sort of to and fro with, with my son who was six years old at the time um, and with my wife, except my then wife. And so it was, a, it was a car really for me to have fun in and to drive to and fro to London to replace the Vauxhall Cavalier. And I also had the 993S also at the time as well, which was my, my 
fair weather car that I drove, uh, which was obviously the performance car, and that was what I drove for, you know, for great days, um, for nice outings. Um, where and, and the Abarth really was going to be a mileage cruncher to replace the Vauxhall Cavalier. I really went into this deeply, as I do with every purchase, and I researched the hell out of it. And I thought, okay, I decided on the specification I wanted. I went when I went down to Plymouth um, and spoke to the guys down there. I, I looked at the different specifications, looked at the different cars that they had, and I decided to specify the car quite highly. Now, what does that include? Now, that includes things like electrochromatic mirrors, which I thought was very important, which has been a great option to have. Um, the Sky sunroof, which is a brilliant sunroof, and, and really, really pleased I spec that. Um, also, items like uh, the pearlescent white paint. Now, I did think about getting a, a black car, but, if, but when I looked at black above 500s, they just looked like a blob. They didn't show any detail. And the lighter colours, as we know, show detail. So I thought, okay, I'll go totally the opposite and I'll go for pearlescent white. Not necessarily the greatest ideas. Not necessarily from two point of views. I'm not a small person and having a pearlescent white above 500 maybe doesn't really fit in with my character. Um, but who cares? You know, I didn't worry about that at the time. Um, and with hindsight, I, I wish I'd gone, I'd gone for a black one, um, but the situation was there. I, I decided to specify Palesa White. I also specified the SS kit. Now the SS kit is a weird tuning kit. It's weird from the respect of it isn't installed originally with the car when you purchase it. So when you purchase the car, when you purchase the Bar 500, first of all, you specify the Bar 500 and then you request the SS tuning kit and it isn't fitted when you purchase the car from you. And you can have the SS kit fitted after a period of time as well after purchasing the car, as long as you haven't exceeded certain mileage and certain revs in the car. So what it what this actually meant was, and this there's a lot of legacy history behind this with the Abarth kits, but what it meant was I purchased and I, I ordered the Abarth 500 and when it arrived, they then installed the SS kit, which came in an SS box, in this, in this large wooden box, really bizarre. And it came parts like a new ECU to, to retune and remap the engine, up to updated springs, updated brakes, um, larger wheels to take into account the larger, the larger discs that were installed. Obviously, smaller wheels would fit over the larger discs. And a few other updates to the car as well, and, and obviously SS badging, etc., that you have on the engine in the engine compartment and also on the back of the car. Now, when I originally spec the car and, and my original car came in, therein lies a clue. I'd said to the dealership, "I'm very picky. I expect this car to be right. It's brand new. I don't expect there to be any faults on it, especially with a pearlescent white paint, which is a triple layer paint. And I will reject it if the car isn't right." <clears throat> the dealership assured me that they would check over the car, there'd be no issues, etc. Unfortunately, when the car arrived in, I checked the car over, I instantly saw stone chips in the white paint. I know that sounds really bizarre and I was really shocked, uh, but apparently not uncommon on the lower, on these lower cost type of cars. I mean, because it's not a supercar or anything, I thought that was bizarre, I expected it to be right and I rejected the car. Now this substantially annoyed the dealership because it was a very highly spec car and me rejecting it meant they had to incorporate that car into their dealership in somehow. So in effect, it had to become their demo car. And that car was around 18 and a half thousand pounds. At the time, that was a highly spec above 500 SS. So it was a very expensive car for them to incorporate into their dealership. Notwithstanding, they should have checked the car over properly and they told me it was fine. I went all the way to Plymouth and it wasn't. Now, there was a complexity incorporated into all that situation in that I'd actually got the scrappage deal on the Vauxhall Cavalier, would you believe it? So the scrappage deal was running then by the government whereby if you chopped in a car that you had in what's called the scrappage deal, then you could get one and a half thousand pounds back for your car. Now, I only paid one and a half thousand pounds. No, sorry, you could get two thousand back, two thousand pounds back for your car. Now, I only paid one and a half thousand pounds for the Vauxhall Cavalier when I bought it. 
So not taking into account servicing, etc. I was actually up in the deal. Would you believe it? You know, I've done crunched all that mileage on that Vauxhall Cavalier. Only bought it for one and a half grand, and I got two grand back for it. But when I went and picked up this original car, the Cavalier had to be brought in as well because I drove the Cavalier down and of course the Cavalier was taken in on the scrappage deal and that had to stay so they had to give me a demo car to drive back home and then they had to come and pick that demo car up. My reordered car then arrived uh, six months later in, as a September build in 2009. So I went and picked the car up in 2009, the reissued version of the car and everything was fine thankfully. There was no issues. And then once I checked the car over and was happy with the car, <clears throat> it was then um, taken back into the garage. I literally just checked the car over, drove it a bit and that was it. Then it went back into the garage to have the SS kit installed. And then the car was trailed over to Paint Shield, who are no longer with us, but Paint Shield PPF installers. And they installed full PPF on the car. Um, well, near as damn it for PPF on the main front sections, the side seal and the end caps, etc. Um, and then I went and collected the car from Paint Shield. Um, so the actual proper collection was from Paint Shield, but I checked the car over because of the reissue problems, um, um, the issues when I when I originally looked to collect the car <coughs> with the issues with the paint, etc. So uh, that was a very important thing to do. As you can hear, the rain, you can probably hear the rain in the background, it's pretty relentless. <laughs> Not the greatest of days to do a filming, but hey, we'll try and pull over somewhere if we can, so I, I can do a bit of a walk around of the car. But um, this weather isn't isn't fantastic, so uh, we'll see what we can do. So that's the back history on the car. So I actually collected the car September 2009, and it replaced my Vauxhall Cavalier, and it was great. I did all the mileage crunching in that car, and it was fantastic. So. Um, we're just driving through Avebury now, which is a very historically famous section for all the, all the historical um, stones. Again, not the greatest of weather for, for uh, such a place, but some of the diehards are there looking over the stones. There's a great pub as well here, which we commonly drop into after we've been uh, doing a bit of filming. Shortly after I collected the car in September 2009, I went through a very embittered divorce. I won't go into that. And it became my only car, apart from the, the 993. So it became my main car. So I didn't have access to the ML270 anymore. The, the wife ended up with that car because of our little boy, Jacob, who's doing all the filming now. He's 19, not so little, but he was six years old then. And it's very important that uh, my ex-wife had the car, had that um, ML um, 4x4 to keep Jacob safe and, you know, for the for the end cap rating of that car, end cap safety rating of that car to keep, to keep Jacob safe. That was obviously the most important thing. Um, so I had the Abar 500 and it became my daily driver literally and it was kept outside all the time and it crunched and crunched the miles. So a lot of you have wondered how it's ended up with such an extensive mileage. Well, that's a lot of the reason to do with it because it wasn't originally going to be my main car because we were using the ML the Mercedes, but it became my main car and I used it for miles and miles, you know, for crunching. And I was, I was competing in cycling events at the time as well, um, mountain biking competition events and also stages of the Tour de France called the TAPS. Um, again, I was using the ML for carrying the bikes around, but I ended up having to use this. So the back seats were always folded forward as they are now, and the bikes would be in here and I'd have to take the front wheel off the bike, but it just dealt with it, you know, the car dealt with it. I managed to get the bikes in, traveled all over the country um, doing all these bike competitions, mountain bike events, etc. Um, and the car was fine, never failed me at all. It was fun, it's been a fantastic car. So I think that's been a, a really useful bit of back history to you, you know, for all those wondering, you know, why a person like me would buy an Abarth 500 in pearlescent white. Um, you know, that hopefully ties all that together and gives you an appreciation of why, why I bought this car. Um, there was a, a lot more to it than, than initially meets the eye. And the car was fantastic. Would I have bought this car had I known I was going through divorce? To be honest, no. I would have bought something more practical. Um, but I don't regret buying it because it, it ended up being very, very practical and very, very reliable. So well done, Abarth.
been a great car, fantastic car. Now to give you an update on where, the, where we are with the car now, if you remember the last update um, was when we had this unpleasant and unfortunate situation where the valves hit the pistons and we had to have a top end rebuild. Now I'll put I'll put the video, I'll put a link to the video in the comments below if you want some more detail on that. I went into it great detail in a previous video, so I'll put that video link in the in the comments below. So please check that out if you haven't seen it already because that will give you all the insight behind that situation and how we got a replacement head from Autotech, um, why I didn't rebuild the engine fully and etc etc. So that gives you all that detail. And that situation occurred um, around November time in 2021 and the engine was rebuilt or the top end was rebuilt in 2022 so around January February this year now the mileage on the car was around 135,000 then the car has now done 142,000 and as you can tell drives fine so it definitely was the right decision just to do a top end rebuild. It didn't need a full engine rebuild. That definitely was the right decision. <clears throat> and the car's been fine. Again, it's just gone into mileage crunching mode and it's just crunched and crunched the miles without any issues. Now I ran the car in or I ran the new head in and the new parts because it had a lot of other new parts on the car as well. Um, you know, cam valves, sprockets, um, tensioners, all those sort of things. So I ran the car in for a thousand miles, which was a recommendation of my mechanic. And the person who did all the work was um, was the person who used to look after my 993S. So a great mechanic, and I, I would trust him with anything, including the Ferrari, but the dealerships look after the Ferrari at the moment. And the car's been fine. Um, it's done 7,000 miles now since that engine rebuild. So since February, January, February time, when I did that video, um, when I did the update video on the engine rebuild, this car has now done 7,000 more miles. It's now on 142,000 miles. 142,000 miles, guys. Is there any Abarths with higher mileage than that on it? If you've got an Abarth, let me know what your mileage is below and let me know if you've had any reliability issues. Hopefully my car hasn't been the only one that's been, that's been very good and been reliable. I'm sure it isn't. I've heard good things about these Abarths. But yeah, let me know, especially if your Abarth has done more mileage than 142,000 from you. And especially if your car is on its original clutch. Yes, guys, this car still has its original clutch and it isn't slipping yet. I've never known a car to last 142,000 miles on its original clutch and not to show signs of slippage. I'm sure I'm gonna have to replace the clutch at some point in the future. I don't know when, it's just going and going, you know, it's been a great performer. So we're outside, we're in the pissing down rain, so we're gonna give you a quick walk around the car because the camera's getting wet, I'm getting drenched and my son, the videographer, is getting drenched. So quick walk around the car to give you an update on the car. As you can see, the car's pretty shitty and dirty again because it's just been used for crunching miles. Haven't given the car a wash recently. This damage was done in a car park um, there, was a, there was a bollard that was about this high. I didn't see the bollard, I parked near the bollard. When I reversed out, it was literally a two mile an hour um, accident. So I just haven't bothered to get it repaired yet, but you can replace this panel and get it resprayed separately. So it's not too much of an expense to repair that. The wheels need refurbishing, but yeah, that's because I just, I just drive the car, you know, I just use it as a daily driver. And um, this is all the old PPF you can see on the car. So the PPF really needs replacing or cleaning because it's all dirty around the edges. And if people are wondering what it is that's curling up around the, around the, um, the seals, you can see it better on the other side. It's actually the PPF on the seal. So this is just the old style PPF that was put there to protect the seal. It's not the paint coming off. That's just the old PPF. The car would actually look really good if it was cleaned properly and if the PPF was replaced in certain areas. The car's been fantastic, as I've said. By the way, this score here, this was where I had it parked. Um, when I was taking the train into work, some git ran a key down the side of it. What a good thing to do, eh? And this hasn't got PPF on it. The doors haven't got PPF on it. That's the sort of people you're dealing with. So I had to stop then parking it in that car park anymore. Um, and that's on a flipping a bath, you know? Now, one of the issues that this car has, and this car has had, is that this wiring loom 
is susceptible to failure because of this, of this hatchback being opened and closed all the time and it causes the stress fractures on, these, on the wires that are connected through to the, to the tailgate. <clears throat> now this wiring was updated and was repaired. You can get a, a very cheap wiring loom update for it, which is the original part around 70 odd quid, I think it is. Um, and Fiat want to charge you 600 pounds odd to, to replace the same part. But my mechanic did it for me, did a fantastic job. Um, and it, in effect, it corrects any problems with failures on the rear number plate lights, the rear wiper and all the other bits, the rear heater, etc., and all the parts that deliver to the rear, to rear tailgate from the, from the main wiring loom. Now this car's developed um, part of the same problem again in that the rear number plate lights, if I put the side lights on, you'll see that the number plate lights don't work. Now the bulbs did blow and I replaced the bulbs um, and then it started working again, but it stopped again and it isn't the bulbs. I've since found out that it could either be this wiring loom fault again, or it could be a problem, which is, which is a well-known issue in this tailgate, in this tailgate handle mechanism. I think it's actually this. Now this is 185 pounds just for the part. Um, and then I'll either fit it myself or get my mechanic to fit it. The car's just passed its MOT, so latest update, it's just passed its MOT, no problem. The lights were working, the number plate lights were working at that time. Um, it's due to be serviced at the end of January. So at the end of January um, next year, because we're currently um, at, the, in the, at the end of December, um, this is, car is going to be serviced and it's going to have um, a, a new right-hand control arm fitted. The left-hand control arm was fitted when the engine was recently rebuilt and it needs another new control arm to replace the bush and the ball joint. It's easier just to replace the control arm rather than trying to press out the bush. So that work's going to be done at the end of January. It'll have a full service as well, which would be the brake fluid replacement, um, oil replacement, oil filter, air filter, and just a general greasing up of the parts, etc., on the car, and a general check over. So that's the Abar 500 SS. In a nutshell, that's the update. 135,000 miles, it had the top end rebuild. It's done 7,000 miles since then. Um, no issues whatsoever. Car is as performant as ever before the rebuild. And it's just fantastic. Been mileage crunching as usual. No issues whatsoever, been super reliable. And the only, the only consumable since that, since that failure is a new set of Pilot Sport 5s that I put on the car. And I always put, I always put Pilot Sports on this car, Michelin Pilot Sports on this car. They've been fantastic for the car usually gets through two sets of front tyres for one set of rear tyres but I've replaced all the, all the tyres on the car so it's now got Pilot Sport 5s and they're working out fantastic. So there's the update on the Abar 500 SS. Let me know in the comments below what you think and again let me know in the comments below if you've got a car that's gone over 142,000 miles especially if it's still got its original clutch. This car has been super reliable. I cannot recommend it enough. If you're looking at getting an Abar 500 just buy it it will never let you down. Thanks a lot for watching guys. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, give it a like, very, very important for us as a small channel at the moment. Massive big reviews coming for you next year. Loads of fantastic cars that we're reviewing for you. Hit that bloody subscribe button guys. Let's move this channel massively forward in 2023. Let's really get us moving forward so we can bring you some even greater reviews and even greater content for you. More 458 com content coming of course once we get into the warmer weather. Thanks a lot for watching guys and we'll see you in the next video. Happy New Year for 2023.